happy Saturday. Netflix recently released its adaptation of The Sandman, so of course I watched that entire thing over the course of the weekend. And while doing that, I emailed myself two topics as possible Saturday classics. One was Encephalitis Lethargica, which is a recurring plot element on the show and the comic that it's adapted from, but which has already had a turn as a Saturday classic. The other one was Giorgio Vasari, who is mentioned in passing once on the show. And that one passing mention made me stop what I was doing and go, hey, didn't we do an episode on him? We did! So our episode on Giorgio Vasari came out on March 7th, 2018. We hope you enjoy. Welcome to Stuff You Missed in History Class, a production of iHeartRadio. Hello and welcome to the podcast. I'm Holly Fry. And I'm Tracy V. Wilson. And this is an art history episode that I have had on my list for a very, very long time. And then I kind of forgot about it. (laughs) That That never happens to me ever. I'm kidding. It (laughs) happens to me all the time. The list is really long, and Tracy has referenced our, like, thousand-item list that we have before, (laughs) but I also just have a separate list that I keep on my phone of things that come up, like, when I'm going about my day in my life. Yeah, even— And then I go back to that sometimes. Yeah, even my my short list, in quotes, is, like, 50 things, which is all of my episodes for a year. (laughs) Yeah, so— Giorgio Vasari was on that list for me for a long time. And then I kind of, you know, it just got sent to the side part of my brain that doesn't really actively think about things. And then uh, I went to the really astonishingly beautiful Michelangelo exhibit that recently closed at the Met. And Vasari comes up in it. Uh, So it reminded me that we should talk about him because uh, Giorgio Vasari is an interesting figure. He was an artist, an architect, and most famously a biographer uh, I feel like we should mention that this is definitely not an exhaustive biography of Vasari that we're doing, in part because he worked on so many different things, and in part because a couple of his works really have some interesting modern-day follow-ups that really, really intrigue me and that I wanted to talk about. So I want to include those for context when we start talking about the 20th and 21st century developments around them. So to get into his basics... Giorgio Vasari was born in the Tuscan provincial capital Arezzo, Italy, on July 30th, 1511. And well-known French stained glass artist Guillaume de Marciat, you'll sometimes see that uh, in Italian-based biographies as Guglielmo de Marciat, was one of Vasari's teachers when the future artist and biographer was still quite young. And that arrangement for tutoring had been made by Vasari's grandfather's cousin, it's a lot of family connections, but basically uh, a, a relative made this deal. That relative was Luca Signorelli, who was a painter, and that relative also taught Giorgio as a young boy. At the urging and arrangement of his father, Vasari moved to Florence in the mid-1520s. There, he apprenticed under painters Andrea del Sarto and Baccio Bandinelli. He also studied alongside two members of the Medici family, Alessandro and Ippolito. The Medici family, which was covered in a series by previous hosts, Sarah and Dublina, became important to Vasari. Duke Cosimo I de' Medici eventually became a longtime patron. And it was also in Florence where Vasari discovered Michelangelo. And at one point, he actually claimed that he studied with Michelangelo, but the veracity of that detail has been questioned. We're going to talk a little bit about when that came up and why it got a little bit of side-eye later in the podcast. Uh, But the two men were friends, and even if Michelangelo never formally taught Vasari, the famed artist strongly influenced his friend's artistic efforts. Vasari painted in the Mannerist style, and that name comes not from a depiction of manners or primness. It comes from the Italian word maniera, and that translates into style or way, as in the manner in which something is done. So it's sometimes called the stylish or stylized style. Mannerism was initially an Italian style centered in Florence and Rome, running from roughly the 1520s up until Baroque art started to overtake it in the 1590s. It did make its way into other parts of Europe, but its popularity was always mainly in Italy. Mannerism generally departs from realism with a sort of calculated artificiality. 
Limbs or necks may be elongated. Poses might be sort of odd with slightly stressed or overcomplicated postures. And colors sometimes appear hypersaturated to the point that they no longer look real. So if you've ever looked at a painting that seems to be an almost realistic portrait from this period, particularly if it's Italian in origin and thought, this is pretty good, but something isn't just isn't quite right, you're probably actually looking at a piece by a mannerist, and that slight offness of the image is intentional. One of Vasari's most famous works is his Last Supper, which was commissioned in 1546. The nuns of the Florentine Murat convent had commissioned the artist to paint this work, and because men were not allowed in the convent, he painted it on five panels that could be moved from his studio into the convent. And this painting is going to come up later on in the show. But Vasari's architecture has been even more celebrated than his painting. The Uffizi in Florence, Italy, was started by Vasari in 1560 for Cosimo I of the Medici family, the Grand Duke of Tuscany, that is the patron Tracy mentioned earlier. And the structure was originally designed to be a government seat, but in 1574, the top floor of it was converted into a gallery by Cosimo's son, Francesco I. The Uffizi eventually became a public gallery, and today the museum is home to some of the most famous works of art in the world, including Botticelli's Birth of Venus and La Primavera, Raphael's Madonna of the Goldfinch, and previous podcast subject Artemisia Gentileschi's Judith and Holofernes. In 1562, thanks to the patronage of Cosimo, Vasari was able to found the Florentine Academy of Design. Everyone ended up connected to that thing. Basically, every famous artist that came through Italy around this time was connected to the Florentine Academy of Design. Also for Duke Cosimo I, Vasari remodeled the Palazzo Vecchio and updated its interiors with art. In 1564, he also built what's known as the Vasari Corridor. And this is a passageway that goes through the center of the city, and it enabled the Medicis to move from the Palazzo Vecchio to the residences at Palazzo Pitti without having to mingle with the public. One of the pieces of art in the Palazzo Vecchio that was done by Vasari is a fresco. It's titled The Battle of Marciano. This fresco is in what's known as the Hall of 500, which got its name from the 500 members of the Grand Council of Florence. It is a massive, massive piece. It's also one of many pieces that Vasari, along with his team of assistants, produced for the Palazzo Vecchio. But that particular painting is going to come up again later on in this show. And far more than his painting or his architecture, Vasari is known for his biographical writing. His book, Lives of the Most Eminent Painters, Sculptors, and Architects, is a massive, multi-volume effort that's considered the beginning of art history writing. The book, first published in 1550, covers a roughly 300-year span from the 13th century up to Vasari's contemporaries in the 1500s. And in addition to biographies, the book contains additional essays about the progression of art through three periods of development that Vasari identified. Those three periods were classical antiquity, the Dark Ages, and the Renaissance. The first edition of this book was well-received. Vasari was already well-known in Florence, but his acclaim quickly grew as his writing started circulating. It was after its publication that his career as an artist and architect really picked up. When Michelangelo read his biography in the book, he was moved to write a poem for Vasari, praising him for granting artists everlasting life through writing. That amuses me because... A lot of folks think of art as giving everlasting life to the artist. Yeah. Uh, yeah, they think of the the art being the legacy. But this was, again, a completely new idea that someone would publish this, this biography of artists. Completely broke all of the previous known conventions of biographies in terms of its subject matter. Uh, and the second edition of this book, which was released in 1568, expanded significantly, including biographies of Vasari himself and other artists that were still living during its writing. And this is the version that's been most commonly translated and became really famous worldwide. This is actually still in print today in some cases. One of the major changes in the second edition is the greater space that was devoted to Michelangelo, who died four years prior to this new edition of the book in 1564. 
Vasari added information about the work Michelangelo created in the time between 1550 and his death, and it describes the lavish funeral arrangements that Vasari, along with members of the Florentine Academy of Design, had staged. Incidentally, Michelangelo is was not a fan of spectacle of that nature and probably would have been horrified by this regal memorial. It's also in this edition that Vasari first claimed, at least in writing, to have studied under Michelangelo. Yeah, the fact that he didn't claim it until after Michelangelo had died made people kind of go, come on, really? <laughs> uh, <laughs> and here is the problem with Vasari's biographical writing. He was not particularly obsessive about ensuring all of it was factual. And he was a little bit gossipy. <laughs> and he prioritized making things exciting for the reader over telling the strict truth. We'll talk about how he handled some of the criticism of his work in just a moment, but first we will pause for a little sponsor break. In that second edition of the book that we referenced before the break, Vasari actually makes a point to address some of the criticism of his work. In one section, he writes in defense of his verbose prose, quote, If it has seemed to some of you that on occasion I have been rather long-winded and somewhat prolix in my writing, having desired as far as possible to be clear and to state matters for others so that things which are not understood or which I have not known how to say at first would at any rate be obvious. And if something said in one place is sometimes repeated in another, there are two reasons for this. First, because the material treated required it. And second, because during the time I rewrote this work and had it reprinted, I was interrupted on more than one occasion, not simply for days, but for months in my writing, either by travel or by an excessive number of tasks, paintings, plans, and building projects. And under such circumstances, it is, in my opinion, and I freely admit it, Almost impossible to avoid errors. So he has (laughs) defended his verbose prose by writing that, which was all one sentence. Uh, Yeah, verbosely, and really boils down to, I'm busy, (laughs) y'all. So some of his stories are also very fanciful. In the life of Giotto, he describes the artist drawing a perfect circle when a sample of his work was requested, and the story claimed that a courtier visited Giotto to tell him that Pope Benedict XI wished to commission a new painting for St. Peter's. He needed to see prospective artists' work to make this decision. And Vasari wrote... Giotto, who was a man of courteous manners, immediately took a sheet of paper and with a pen dipped in red, fixing his arm firmly against his side to make a compass of it, and with a turn of his hand, he made a circle so perfect that it was a marvel to see it. Having done it, he turned smiling to the courtier and said, here is the drawing. But he, thinking he was being laughed at, asked, am I to have no other drawing than this? This is enough and too much, replied Giotto. Send it with the others and see if it will be understood. So at this point in the story, according to Vasari, the messenger thinks that he is being mocked and he leaves, but he does include that circle image with other art that he submits to the Pope. Uh, And it described then to the Pope Giotto's seemingly effortless circle. And the Pope, quote, saw that Giotto must surpass greatly all the other painters of his time. And Vasari continues... So the Pope made him come to Rome, and he painted for him in St. Peter's, and there never left his hands work better finished. Wherefore the Pope, esteeming himself well served, gave him 600 ducats of gold, besides having shown him so many favors that it was spoken of through all Italy. So the story has never been verified. It has been retold and used as an example of artistry ever since Vasari first wrote it down. This whole story of the perfect circle is also used for didactic purposes. If you search the web, you will find lots of examples of writers using it to non-artists, that whatever their skill set, it's better to show their abilities in simple, direct ways rather than feeling compelled to spend too much time convincing someone else of what they have to offer. I'm going to say it reminds me of, like, the terrible job advice that you will find in job advice books who were like, Just show up at the company to try to get their attention instead of doing what they asked you to do when applying for the job. So, 
uh, even though it's kind of questionable advice, Basari's possibly made up stories do have legs. Yeah, his, uh, I will say his work is really entertaining and it does make you think, even if it's maybe, uh, strictly from his mind and not from reality. Vasari's Lives of Artists was also fairly biased toward Italian art as better than all others. Regarding the Renaissance, Vasari credited Cimabue and Giotto with its inception and listed Michelangelo as the culmination of this rebirth period. It has also been called a work of pro-Medici propaganda for the rich and powerful family because it cast them, and specifically Cosimo I, who it's dedicated to, as benevolent philanthropists and leaves out any of the bad stuff about them. Vasari has been criticized for his almost fawning writing about the works of Michelangelo. Here's an excerpt of his writing about Michelangelo's famous sculpture, David. Quote, When it was built up and all was finished, he uncovered it, and it cannot be denied that this work has carried off the palm from all other statues, modern or ancient, Greek or Latin. And it may be said that neither the Marforio in Rome, nor the Tiber and Nile of the Belvedere, nor the giants of Monte Cavallo are equal to it in any respect. With such proportion, beauty, and excellence did Michelangelo finish it." For in it may be seen the most beautiful contours of legs with attachments of limbs and slender outlines of flanks that are divine, nor has there ever been seen a pose so easy or any grace to equal that in his, in this work, or feet, hands, and head so well in accord, one member with another in harmony, design, and excellence of artistry, and of a truth, whoever has seen this work need not trouble to see any other work executed in sculpture, either in our own or in other times, by no matter what craftsman. So, so yeah, basically, that is it. If you can only see one statue in your life, see this one. Uh, To be fair, Michelangelo is amazing. I mean, I can understand why it would uh, inspire that kind of writing. But despite these criticisms, Vasari's book continues to be recognized as a vitally important moment in art history. It is entertaining, it even comes off as a little flip at times, but it also set the tone of art history writing going forward. And it is still used as a primary source by scholars, though its problems are acknowledged. It's not like they set it out and say, this is all correct. They're kind of like, this. there's some problems with this text, but it is an important text. Uh, he is often called the first art historian. And he certainly did not invent the biography. There had been plenty of those written by the mid-1500s. But he was the first in Europe to write about the lives of artists. Six years after the second edition of his book was published, Vasari died in Florence on June 27th, 1574. He was 62. All right, we are about to delve into uh, some interesting modern happenings regarding two of Vasari's works. So to keep all of that together, we're going to go ahead and take our sponsor break a little bit early, and we'll do that now. important pieces of Vasari history are actually fairly recent developments. The first is tied to that painting that we mentioned in the Hall of 500, the Battle of Marciano. It is possible that this painting is actually hiding a lost work of Leonardo da Vinci's titled The Battle of Angiari. First, here's the story on da Vinci's painting. In 1504, Leonardo da Vinci was commissioned by a statesman named Piero Soderini to paint a battle from 1440 featuring an army from Milan being defeated by Italian forces in Tuscany. Leonardo da Vinci took the commission, but the painting, which was done using a new oil technique that he wanted to try, was not ever finished. Allegedly, the paint was just too thick and it started to slide and drip down the wall before it could dry. After a number of efforts were made to save the work, da Vinci determined that it was a lost cause. Coincidentally, another fresco on the opposite wall, started by Michelangelo, also went unfinished. In the case of Michelangelo's project, he was called away to work on one of his most famous efforts, the tomb of Pope Julius II. Both of these unfinished works remained in their abandoned state for decades. When Cosimo I decided to renovate the Palazzo Vecchio, both pieces were believed to have been destroyed to make way for new art by Vasari and his team. 
Art historians have wondered for years about this lost Da Vinci painting and whether it still existed somewhere. In the 1970s, one researcher, Maurizio Serratini, from the University of California, San Diego, thought he found a clue when he noticed a green banner in Vasari's painting with the words Cercatrova painted on it. That meant seek and find. So this was perceived to be a clue left behind by Vasari. And a team eventually was granted permission to use high-frequency radar to scan the room. And they found that there was a hollow space behind Vasari's painting, Battle of Marciano. The next step, and all of this was playing out very slowly over years and years, was to drill a series of tiny holes in the Vasari work to send a camera into the wall and see if they could find evidence of this lost painting. And that is where things got really hairy. There was a very vocal resistance to the plan in the art history community. After all, it was going to be putting little holes in a known piece of historically significant art in the hopes of finding an even more significant piece underneath it, maybe. And at some point in this back and forth, it was agreed in 2011 that the team could proceed with their plan to run a tiny camera through the front of Vasari's painting. But they could only run it through existing cracks or drill into spaces that had only recently been restored so that their plan was significantly changed from the 14 spots they had originally planned to drill. And they only had one week that they were allowed to do this research. Video captured masonry work and possible brush strokes on a surface, and a sample of grit captured from the shallow void behind the Vasari showed some evidence of black pigment when it was tested, which made it seem like the team was really onto something. But before you get really invested, that's sort of where the story ends. 150 art historians from museums and galleries around the world put together a petition to stop this project. An investigation was opened by the Florence magistrates. The search for the painting, which was part of a project that National Geographic was filming for a show, was halted completely in the fall of 2012. Art scholars made the case that the money that was being put into this project would have been better spent on restoring the Vasari that they were trying to drill holes into, and that Saracini's initial clue of the words in the Vasari painting really was not all that illuminating to begin with. They were kind of surprised that things had gone this far just based on one kind of hunch that started 30 years prior. The second modern event around Vasari is a lot more satisfying, although it starts out pretty harrowing. Indeed, it does. Uh, In 1966, after days and days of rain, the Arno River overflowed its retaining walls and flooded Florence, Italy. This was a historic, catastrophic event for the city. You will find articles about the Great Florence Flood. And a great deal of art was covered in muddy, oily water. Vasari's massive 8 by 21 foot, that's 2.4 by 6.4 meter, long painting of the Last Supper that we referenced earlier, was created in 1546, was badly damaged. At the time of the flood, the painting was no longer at the convent where it had been first delivered. That convent had eventually closed, and in 1865, the work was moved to the Castellani Chapel in the Basilica of Santa Croce. It was moved once again to the Museum of Opera Refectory in the 1950s. During the flood, the painting was completely submerged for more than 12 hours. The lower parts of the work were covered in this oily, dirty water for much longer. And initially, all that conservators could do was separate the five panels of the painting and try to get them dried as quickly but as carefully as possible, and then apply a paper treatment to each of the separated panels to prevent the paint from peeling away. The paper that was used was a Japanese wet-strength mulberry paper, and after it was laid on top of the Last Supper, methacrylate resin was painted over it. But additional damage was still forthcoming. The separated panels were placed on different racks to dry, but the panels themselves shrank and cracked in the process. That base layer of gesso shifted around as well, and that was how it was stored for almost 50 years. Yeah, as things shrank and that base layer started to shift, they basically were like, let's not touch this anymore. Let's set it aside and store it as safely as we can and see what sorts of preservation technologies develop that maybe will help us fix this. Let's hope 
future peoples can fix this. <laughs> yes, in short, stop touching it. Um, in 2004, the painting was moved, still in pieces, to the Opificio della Pietra Dure in Florence. And the OPD, as it is known, is the first modern lab focused on art restoration in Italy. As technology did develop that would enable conservators to restore the painting, the 2010 Getty Foundation funded the OPD with a grant to train their staff to treat the damaged artwork. The $329,000 grant was made with a long-term goal that would enable the OPD to employ experts to train conservators for two generations to stabilize and restore damaged works of art. Yeah, so it wasn't just this Last Supper that they wanted to be able to save. They wanted to really create a legacy uh, and a, a groundwork of knowledge for the OPD so that they would be able to save more art going forward. And that resin and paper that kept the paint intact also caused some challenges to restoration efforts. The acrylic resin turned out to be difficult to remove without further damaging the painting. But after several years at the OPD, a system was developed to remove the paper sheets while maintaining the integrity of the paint. And this offered the first real hope that the painting would be restored. The Getty Foundation described the work on the Last Supper this way, quote, together the team developed a conservation solution based on the support system originally devised by Vasari himself, which has stabilized the painting while also allowing the wooden panels to move naturally with standard temperature and humidity fluctuations. The team was also able to recover an unanticipated amount of the original painted surface, revealing the artist's hand in surprising detail. That shrinkage that had taken place after the flood water dried out was slowly reversed by expanding the panels with these tiny poplar wood pieces that would be inserted into slits in the back side of the panels. Another grant provided by Prada in 2014 paid for the cost of very meticulously smoothing out and restoring the paint on the face of the painting. On the 50th anniversary of the flood, November 4th, 2016, Vasari's Last Supper was once again viewable to the public for the very first time. Yeah, so that is a, uh, a nice way, I think, to end it with a piece of art being saved so that we can all uh, appreciate Vasari's work uh, forever, hopefully. Oh, yeah. And it's interesting that painting was what he was maybe least lauded for, but we uh, we have painting as well as his architecture still stands, certainly, and his book has been published and published over and over. So we have a lot of, of Vasari circulating still in the uh, the modern culture, which I love. Thanks so much for joining us on this Saturday. Since this episode is out of the archive, if you heard an email address or a Facebook URL or something similar over the course of the show, that could be obsolete now. Our current email address is historypodcast at iheartradio.com. Our old How Stuff Works email address no longer works. You can find us all over social media at Missed in History. And you can subscribe to our show on Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, the iHeartRadio app, and wherever else you listen to podcasts. Stuff You Missed in History Class is a production of iHeartRadio. For more podcasts from iHeartRadio, visit the iHeartRadio app, Apple Podcasts, or wherever you listen to your favorite shows. <laughs> 